All right, so yeah, I'm gonna do a keynote. And so this is an interesting topic. I started on this idea months ago, and I said, well, um, this is probably gonna be on the last day of the conference. What could I say that would um, really irk the most amount of people? Um, so my title today is called In Search of the Kubernetes Rails Moment. And in case this is not clear, I'm talking about Ruby on Rails. <laughs> so who is this guy? Wow, I'm introducing myself a lot today. Um, I am Brian Lyles, Senior Staff Engineer at VMware, and I like alliteration. So, um, celebrating the hip-hop culture, cars, computers, and creating a better world. That is what I am about. But really, um, I want to focus on this first item, um, celebrating the hip-hop culture. And what I'm going to present to you, without actually even saying it, is um, this talk. And this talk is hip-hop. And you're like, what? We're going to do a talk on hip-hop at a, at, a, at a cloud native event? Yeah, we're going to do a talk on hip-hop. And what I mean by hip-hop, and what you probably think of as hip-hop, is um, music. Like that song that I, was that I walked into multiple times, that song is actually entitled hip-hop. And the reason I chose that song is to craft this particular message right now. Um, hip-hop is not just the music. Hip-hop is DJing. Hip-hop is, is basically MCing, which I am doing right now. Um, hip-hop is graffiti. The graffiti art is hip-hop. And hip-hop is b-boying. We'll get into that a little bit later. And the reason I bring that up is because I think it will actually tie this together. The, um, the first lyric of that song is, when the music hits, hits you in your brain, you will feel no pain. And I'm gonna tie that into Kubernetes is that when we get our jobs right, when we actually figure out what we're doing, our community will feel no pain because we've fixed that. Our companies will feel no pain because we are able to execute in a better fashion. So my whole life, this revolves around hip hop. And since I'm up on the stage, um, I spent some time over the last year writing an application that is open source. Um, I was like, well, why not I talk about it for a second? So um, I am the project lead for this tool called Octin. And the reason we created Octin was because when I talk to a developer and I say, what is your problem with Kubernetes? And they're saying, well, I don't really know what's going on. So the premise of Octant was, instead of asking our users to figure out, figure out what's going on, why don't we just tell them? Um, believe it or not, um, we know computers, and we can tell people how to solve their problems. So check out Octant. It's pretty cool. Got a lot of great response from the project here, and um, I'm just super happy to be able to share it. So on to the talk. And um, I, from, I forgive me for the flashing thing, but this right here, um, this video is the start of a moment. This video came out in 2005, and it's the Rails Oops video. So David Hanemeyer Hansen, who I will refer to as DHH for the rest of this talk, created this blog post using this brand new web framework he called, called Ruby on Rails in this video. And the best part about this video was every 30 seconds he would go, oops, oops, oops. But at the end of it, he had a fully functioning, albeit poorly styled, web application that could serve as a blog. In that moment in 2005, going into 2006, actually um, changed how we think about writing software. So with Rails, we didn't really bring anything new to the table. Um, it used this old esoteric Japanese programming language called Ruby. But what Rails brought to the table was this idea of convention over configuration. And that's what we're going to dive into in this talk. So how does Rails and Kubernetes actually relate? I don't know. Um, and what lessons can Kubernetes learn from Rails? So just to put it out there and you know, pat ourselves on the back, um, according to GitHub, Kubernetes is beating Rails by watchers and stars 
and forks. So what really can this project that is actually way more popular than, than Ruby on Rails learn from Rails? Well, let me go into this really interesting um, idea. Like, we're on a whole new thought here now. So I don't want to be, um, I don't want to actually push anyone out, but this right here is YAML. We love YAML, right? You're kidding. You're just making, you're saying that to make me feel better. No one really loves YAML. <laughs> but um, I wanted to show this piece of YAML here. So this is a deployment for installing Nginx into your cluster. Kind of neat. Well, let's actually pick this apart a little bit. So on, on a line there, and I actually have it crossed out now, um, if we only want one replica, why do we have to specify replicas? Let's get rid of it. Well, what if we, um, so here's something that really is, I understand why it is in Kubernetes, but um, there's duplication inside of the YAML because we actually specify selectors and we specify the pod labels. And I know the reason why we do this, but you know what? Let's get rid of that too. Um, you know, why don't we just assume everything is port 80? And there are definitely good reasons why not to assume everything is port 80. But since we're deleting things, let's delete that too. So is this convention over configuration into Rails? Can we just in, in, introduce more conventions in the, into, into our deployment YAML to make it simpler? Well, we could. But maybe you want a liveness check. Is this thing actually going to run? Well, we'll add that. And I want a readiness check. This thing is ready to serve traffic. We'll add that too. Want to access the volume because we have config data that lives on a store somewhere? Well, put that in there. I want to access secrets? Well, we're putting things in there. Might as well put something else in there too. And here is the greatest troll in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem right now, um, pod affinities and anti-affinities. That's how you would do a pod affinity and anti-affinity. We'll add that in there too. And what we're seeing now is that um, just having the idea of conventions doesn't make anything simpler. And just, um, and we really need to think about how can we um, embrace this concept of Rails in the Kubernetes. Well, just stripping out features is not going to work. So here is something that isn't said often enough. Um, I, I hear this a lot. I see it on social media. We're not using Kubernetes because it's complex. Well, let me share something with you. Kubernetes runs on bare metal, it runs in VMs, it runs in other people's clouds, it runs on your Raspberry Pi. Kubernetes supports uh, multiple types of container runtimes, multiple types of networking runtimes, multiple types of storage runtimes, and guess what? Um, people are shipping this software today. Kubernetes complexity is necessary complexity. So when someone says it's too hard, it's just because, um, frankly, they're selfish and they only think about their particular problem. We need to create problems that help others. So how do we capture the essence of Rails without diluting the power of Kubernetes? Because we don't want to do that. We don't want to be selfish. So um, I, I just can't help but talk about more YAML. And just because I'm on stage here and I'm giving the keynote, I'm going to redefine some terms. Um, YAML is for computers. It's not for humans. Humans can read it. That's cool. But YAML, ooh, YAML is for computers. So because um, I'm up here making things up, since YAML is for computers, we'll just consider YAML as assembler because that's not a problem, is it? And because I love taking analogies and metaphors too far, Let's write some assembler. Um, this is 8088 assembler, not confused with 65 assembler or MIPS assembler or, or Spark assembler or anything like that. Um, I got to make this fit on a slide. So we're going to write a program real quick. Um, we're going to take um, 13 hex and we're going to move it to our AX register. We're going to call interrupt 10. And then we're going to move a 8000. And I know that's not how you say it, but I like saying 8000 instead of A000. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to move AX to ES, and we're going to move 0 to AX, and then we're going to move AX to DI, and then we're going to move 7 into DL, and then we're going to do something even crazier, is we're going to move DL into ES colon DI. What have we done? 
<laughs> well, really, um, we haven't done much. We put a pixel, well, we changed our screen resolution if we're running DOS on, uh, to 320 by 200, and we put a gray pixel in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Not descriptive, not helpful, but this is how we used to write software. Um, I started writing programming in C, and my second, link, and my second um, thing that I got to touch was TASM. So I actually thought this is how we wrote computers. This is how I thought we computered. But it's not productive. Um, we've learned lessons since then, and we can actually do things at a higher, this is the same kind of code, and it's Python for Windows. But what if I'm running a Mac? This is not helpful. What if I'm running uh, Linux? This is not helpful. So why do I show that? Well, I show it because um, just working at the level of YAML isn't really what we want. We want to work at higher level. But what does that higher level look like? I don't know. So here's where I want to be. Um, and I know um, a lot of my friends out there um, have tried to do this. Um, I don't want to write YAML. I want my app to say, hey, computers, I'm coming. Um, get yourself ready. But uh, really, um, I mean, that's what you all want, too. But um, because that isn't happening, we're all employed and we're here talking about this thing. But this is where we want to be. We want to solve bigger problems. And now I want to do something else, introduce you to some other terms, um, LLVM. Fun note about LLVM is when LLVM started, it was called the low-level virtual machine. Right now, do you know what LLVM stands for? Um, it's LLVM. They're like, screw it, no one can get it right, so we'll just call it LLVM. It's like it's a fun note. But LLVM is interesting. What it is, is it's a system where you specify a front end, and then you have an optimizer that optimizes, and then you have a back end that does back end stuff. And generally that back end stuff is you create machine level code. So depending on the platform, x86, x64, ARM, ARM64, um, MIPS, um, Z architecture, it can do all that. Um, so what's on the front end? It's our programming languages. Besides Go, it's funny, we use Go, but Go doesn't use LLVM. And I think it should use LLVM, but it doesn't. But it's a Google thing. Um, so things like GCC, things like Julia, things like the Haskell LLVM compiler, they compile to this front end. And, and they produce all this on the back end. How can we actually learn from this? Or actually, before that, I'm going to tell you why we have LLVM. Um, some smart people realized that with LL, what, we were solving the problems again and again and again and not the same way and not well. So we would have this problem where we needed to have some optimizations or we wanted to have a, uh, an interpreter and we wanted to be able to do some just-in-time work on it. Or we wanted to have an output and I wanted to compile this thing and I wanted to have ARM and x86-64. LLVM helped us solve that problem. Now, as a language developer, I don't need to think about that. I can just write, I can just write to this front end, and the front end will help us. But what can we learn from that in Kubernetes land? Well, we can take that front end, optimizer, and back end. And then what we can do is we can change the words. So our app and its, front, and its intentions are the front end. Um, you know, question marks are the optimizer, and that's what we need to figure out. And the back end is the Kubernetes back end. And before I was saying that um, Kubernetes YAML was assembler, but maybe it's not assembler. Maybe it's machine code. And no one wants to write machine code or think about machine code. So how do we turn our app and its intentions into this machine code, AKA YAML? And that's what we need to figure out. And this is a keynote and not a tech talk, so guess what? I'm not gonna tell you how to do it. I'm telling you to think about how to do it. And then I also want to remind you of this. Kubernetes is a vehicle taking us to our destination and not the destination itself. Too many times we focus on Kubernetes as a product. It is not a product. It is a fancy car. Is it an electric car or um, a gasoline-powered car? I don't know. But it is a car. So let's go back to this middle box. In this middle box, I just throw out some things. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could just figure out how to automatically do CI or automatically do CD? Or even if you work in a regulated environment, how to automatically do auditing? And a lot of you have never worked for a bank or a health company and don't understand about auditors. But auditors are the people who mean well, but wow. Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, and I'm not here to talk bad about anybody, but yeah. 
My friends who work in regulated environments know. Um, and then it's back end. Here's something else we don't want our developers thinking about. Um, generating YAML, um, applying security policies, that should just work. You know what security policies are, apply them. Or network policies, you know what they are, apply them. Um, wiring up observability, you know our developers should be developing, and should they be conscious of all of this? Yes, yes they should. But should we hold up development because they can't understand how to wire up observability? No, we should not. So, um, I'm trying to think about how to say this not controversially. Um, okay, think about this. Um, we have a horizontal line and we have a vertical line. The horizontal line, the line of the landscape, is our landscape, it's our ecosystem. It's all the projects and all the technologies that we require to be able to do what we want to do. And this vertical line going up is all the organizations. It's the CNCF, Platinum and Diamond and Gold members. It's the people who need to make money in this space. We cannot mess up the line. We have to keep the line straight. If all of our companies, what we should be doing is figuring out how to inject whatever goodness that we are going to inject without breaking the ecosystem. And this is one of the things that I love and one of the things that we actually were very conscious about when we're actually putting together um, KubeCon Cloud NativeCon. You'll notice that none of the speakers up here really sold their companies. That's because them selling the companies is for the booths. Them providing enhancements is their business. Um, we don't want to ally those uh, we don't want to push out those opinions here. We want the ecosystem to not be broken because one company needs to make money. There is plenty of opportunity for corporations to provide optimizations to our ecosystem without breaking our community. So, Rails convention over configuration. Well, what does it mean? It means that basically, um, I'm gonna give you a good set of defaults because I know what's happening. And um, this is the only typo on my slides, by the way. Um, you can use them until you outgrow them. And you can change them, but you don't break everything else. Something else we can learn from Rails. Things we have should have good defaults. Rails is really good at defaults. Um, our defaults should be easy to override. And our primary job, oh, second typo on these slides, is to find um, those good defaults. Um, I'm senior staff engineer at VMware. My job should be called default, senior staff default engineer. You're a principal architect. You're the principal architect of defaults. Think about that. So other things that Kubernetes can learn from Rails, and this will be fun, pay attention, because you're going to be like, whoa. Um, Rails people freed people from thinking about serving web requests. Um, which led to people rethinking um, about the Sinatra project. This was this random Ruby project um, that actually allowed us to have Heroku. And when with Heroku, they actually led to us rethinking about how we thought about paths, which gave us a concept of git push Heroku master, which inspired Deus Labs to imitate that concept. And then you know, yada, 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 Helm. <laughs> And I can do it again. DHH developed Rails and TextMate, which moved developers to Max, to Max to use TextMates. Most of you all here using TextMate right now is because a Ruby on Rails developer thought it was a good idea. Think about that. Um, and this led to the resurgence of the text editor, which ultimately gave us VS Code. Crazy. Thank DHH and Rails for that. I can do it again. Um, Rails freed Mac users to think about other problems, which led to the creation of Homebrew. Homebrew is written in Ruby, that esoteric Japanese language, which is actually pretty amazing. Rails has inspired a whole generation of developers to think outside of the box. And funny thing enough, Rails, Ruby on Rails got me on this stage right now because I met Dan and we actually just realized we were both at the same um, Ruby on Rails event in 2006 together. Rails got us here. So Kubernetes, on, Kubernetes Ruby on Rails moment is just simply making a better Kubernetes. And um, the Kubernetes on Rails moment is making the ecosystem better. Because Kubernetes allows us to think about the more important things. You know, all these things we think about in Kubernetes are fine, but that's not the important piece. 
So we've been here before. Um, Linux did this, which is crazy. Um, we're not the first. Linux went through the same journey. Um, so my call to action is, let's make Kubernetes enable our journeys. Let's find Rails Kubernetes moment. And just to make sure that I'm ending this on hip hop, I used to be able to do that. <laughs> Thank you.